welcome you to the Fall 2020 Franciscan Zoom Lecture Series, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Sister Mary Beth Ingham is a sister of the St. Joseph of Orange in California. She is professor of philosophical theology at the Franciscan School of Theology. She's also Professor Emerita and Distinguished Scholar in Philosophy at Loyola Mar Marymount University in Los Angeles. Sister Mary Beth holds a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Freiburg in Switzerland and has published widely on the thought of the Franciscan master, Blessed John Dun Scotus. More recently, she has turned her focus to the centrality of beauty for the Franciscan tradition. And this is her topic for this evening. Her recent publication, Rejoicing in the Works of the Lord, Beauty in the Franciscan Tradition, links the insight of the spiritual tradition to those of the great Franciscan masters, Alexander of Hales, Bonaventure of Banyaraggio, and John Dun Scotus. The Pathway of Beauty, the Via Pulchritudinis, is at the foundation of Franciscan life and thought. It is fitting that we consider this foundation in our vision series. In addition to her numerous publications, Sister Mary Beth is a frequent speaker at the Franciscan Federation gatherings and retreat centers. I welcome you, Sister Mary Beth. Thank you for joining me this evening for uh, my presentation on the Franciscan way of beauty. In her 1998 Tanner lectures, Professor Elaine Scarry, the Cabot Professor of Aesthetics at Harvard University, called for a recovery of an authentic intellectual appropriation of beauty. In her talks, published under the title on beauty and being just. Professor Scarry argues for the centrality of beauty and of a sense of the beautiful for any genuine model of human formation, whether academic or spiritual. Indeed, beauty is neither a distraction nor a frivolous object for human meditation. Rather, beauty is the central human experience needed today, she argues, by our society and indeed our world. As Professor Scarry makes clear, the recovery of beauty she's calling for is not the recovery of personal sensibilities or simply matters of preference or taste. Rather, it's the recovery of an authentic human experience that transcends times and cultures. It's an experience that we have all known at one time or another in our lives. The experience itself often defies definition, but is profoundly human and deeply transformative of the Franciscan vision. And we do well to reflect on this experience tonight as we look forward to celebrating the transitus and the feast of St. Francis. The pathway traced out by beauty holds a key, not simply to a renewed moral vision, but to a renewed way of living a human life. Voices throughout the tradition give witness to this, and it's called the via pulchritudinis, a way of life where creativity and relationship, mutuality and generosity are the central human virtues. These virtues are born out of our experience of humility and transformation, the presence of beauty. They are themselves dynamic and transformative moments in our lives. Professor Scarry's argument should come as no surprise to those living and working in the Franciscan tradition. After all, beauty has always held a place of honor in the spirituality of Francis and his followers. 
creation celebrated in the Canticle of Creatures, the human person and divine generosity celebrated in Claire's letters to Agnes of Prague, all capture the centrality of beauty for Franciscans. And how else would we describe these if not by the term beautiful? But it's not just scholars and saints, for scientists now agree as well. In a 2019 article in the New York Times, Ferris Jaber writes, and I quote, if there is a universal truth about beauty, some concise and elegant concept that encompasses every variety of charm and grace in existence, we do not yet understand enough in order to articulate it. What we call beauty is not simply one thing or another, neither wholly purposeful nor entirely random, neither merely a property, nor is it a feeling. For beauty is a dialogue, a dialogue between the perceiver and the perceived. Beauty is the world's answer to the audacity of a flower. It's the way a bee spills across the lip of a yawning buttercup. It's the care with which a satin bowerbird selects a hibiscus bloom. It's the impulse to recreate water lilies with oil and canvas. It's the need to place roses on a grave. For the Franciscan tradition, beauty is not simply reducible to a single experience. Indeed, beauty launches a transformative cycle of praxis that begins with an initial moment of awe. The experience of beauty stops us short. We sense the need to look again, to pay closer attention to what's happening around us and within us. Looking again, we question our initial attitude. We're prepared to revise our opinions. We're ready to admit we may have made a mistake. In the spiritual life, we call this type of awakening a conversion. This evening, I'd like to explore with you all some of the richness of this Franciscan vision of beauty and how it grounds a renewed vision of the world, of God, and of one another. And Francis himself gives us the model. As Celano writes, this happy traveler hurrying to leave the world as the exile of pilgrimage was helped and not just a little by what is in the world. Toward God, however, he used it as the clearest mirror of goodness. In art, he praises the artist. Whatever he discovered in creatures, he guides to the creator. He rejoices in all the works of the Lord's hands and through their delightful display, he gazes on their life-giving reason and cause. In beautiful things, he discerns beauty itself. All good things cry out to him. The one who made us is best. Through the beauty of creation and the created world, as we know, Francis of Assisi discerned beauty itself. For all beauty points beyond itself to that beauty beyond time and change. So the world in all its fragile beauty invites us today on this journey of transformation. In his beautiful encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis has called us to recognize and respond to the gift around us here in this life, on this beautiful earth, we encounter the sacred 
just as Francis did, and were called to a renewed ethic of kinship with all that exists. This ethic we're called to is a deeper relationship, an ethic of solidarity, of recognizing how we too are a part of a beautiful created tapestry. How might our lives be transformed by a shift in attitude from an ethic of stewardship and care to an ethic of kinship, relationship, and solidarity? Bonaventure certainly emphasizes the beauty of the created world as a pathway to God. For him, all reality expresses divine beauty. For God is a fountain fullness of beauty and grace. And in this passage taken from his beautiful itinerarium, The Journey of the Mind into God, Bonaventure states, if we but consider the diversity of lights and forms and colors in stones and metals and in plants and animals, proclaiming the attributes of God. So whoever is not enlightened by such great splendor in created things is blind. Whoever remains unheedful of such great outcries is deaf. Whoever does not praise God in all these effects is dumb, and here by dumb he means unable to speak. Whoever does not turn to the first principle after so many signs, and we might say after so much beauty, is indeed a fool. I'm sure many of you have seen some of the beautiful photographs taken of the universe through the Hubble telescope. We know they're posted each day by NASA, and every day you can check in and see what's happening in the universe. Right now, we're looking at a photograph of beauty that has existed long before we were born, just now arriving for us to see, to witness, to enjoy, and to praise God. And to think all of this beauty in the universe is going on at all times, and we're unable to see it because our eyes are not large enough, our vision is not strong enough. So we have telescopes that bring us such beautiful beauty in the universe and all around us. When we allow ourselves to be awakened by such beauty, by the giftedness of all that exists, we're opened to go further in the cycle of beauty, to walk another step in the via pulchritudinis, and to look again, to see anew, to open the eyes of our eyes and to open the ears of our ears to see and hear, to be enlightened by what is before us. And this moment in the Via Pulchritudinus introduces us to a new moment of enlightenment. And it surrounds the incarnation. For the incarnation is an expression of ultimate divine beauty. Bonaventure's emphasis on the beauty of creation as the first step toward union with God enables him to reflect further on salvation history. And in his Revoloquium, he states, quote, what is more benevolent for the master to redeem the slave than by taking the form of the servant? For this is an act of unfathomable goodness and no greater act of mercy, kindness, and friendship can be conceived. This was the most appropriate as Bonaventure states, but I think we can transpose this and say, this was the most beautiful way for God to express divine power, divine wisdom, and divine benevolence. And John Dunn Scotus, in the following generation, goes even further in his reflection. Called the subtle doctor because of the difficulty of his reasoning, and called the Marian doctor 
because he articulated the argument that would be used to defend the Immaculate Conception, Scotus also laid out the Franciscan position on the Incarnation. Like Bonaventure, he reflected on divine beauty as it's expressed in the person of Jesus Christ, God become one of us. For Scotus, there is no greater or more beautiful act than for God to become one of us. And he affirms for the tradition that the incarnation would have taken place even had Adam and Eve not sinned. And this is the result of Scotus's reflection on the nature of God as infinite love and on the affirmation that the incarnation is God's greatest work of art. So God is the divine artist. Creation and the incarnation capture that artistry in our own day. By reflecting on the beauty of divine goodness, Scotus invites us to think differently about divine love. And he argues that since the incarnation is the greatest and most beautiful act God could do, then it must depend on divine love alone and not on our fragility, not on our sin, not on our weakness. Indeed, citing St. Paul, Scotus argues, divine love is debtor to no one but itself. This makes of the incarnation the primary plan, the plan decreed by God before the foundation of the world, before creation, before the angels were brought into being. And everything God has done in creation and in salvation history, in the covenant, has been done, Scotus argues, in order to prepare for the incarnation. So God's intention to become human is prior to any sin. This doesn't do away with sin. It simply argues that our sinfulness is not the reason God becomes human. Rather, God's love is the reason that God became human. And divine love does not rejoice at the misfortune of another, nor should we. And any of you who are familiar with the exultet that we sing at the Easter vigil would recognize rejoicing in the misfortune of another. For we do pray in the exultet, O happy fault, O necessary evil, for Adam and Eve to have sinned. Because if they had not sinned, the incarnation would never have taken place. In his argument, Scotus presents to the tradition and to history the Franciscan insight about divine beauty made manifest in the person of Jesus Christ and made manifest in divine love. The result of this new way of understanding the incarnation introduces us with the Franciscans into a dramatic paradigm shift. For now our human nature, our humanity, has been destined from all eternity to be glorified in and through Christ Jesus. Now we can see ourselves in Jesus as God sees us, as images of Christ, imago Christi, as Francis says in his Admonition 5, for God created us and formed us to the image of his beloved son. So we are created not just in the image of God, imago Dei, but in the image of Christ, imago Christi. And therefore we're invited by Jesus to become his friends, not his servants, giving us and elevating us to a dignity beyond anything we might hope or imagine. And if we reflect for a moment on Admonition 5, we see the beginning 
Birds, where Francis says, be conscious of the wondrous state. We might think of this as modern people that we are, that being conscious is just remember, don't forget the wondrous state in which God has placed you. But in fact, what Francis is inviting us to do is to attend to the wondrous state, pay attention to the wondrous state, to nurture the wondrous state in which the Lord God has placed us. So it's not simply an invitation to recognize that we are made in the image of Christ, but rather it's an invitation for us to nurture continually the image of Christ within us. And that introduces us into the transformative cycle of beauty that we are then called to respond in ways that live up to our true vocation in the image of Christ. Thomas Merton is a very famous writer who, as many know, was deeply, deeply influenced by the Franciscan tradition, and in particular, by this Franciscan argument around the incarnation and what it means for human dignity. And we know, because he recounts in his famous classic Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, he recounts his moment of conversion in Louisville, where he writes his recognition of having the immense joy of being a human being, a member of a race in which God became incarnate. You know, so often in our lives, we hear people say, well, I'm only human. And the Franciscan tradition would say back, don't say only human. I am human. As if the sorrows and stupidities of the condition, the human condition, could overwhelm me, as I'm sure so many of us are overwhelmed by what's happening in our world and in our nation. But now Merton invites us to realize what we all are. And he pleads, if only everybody could realize this. But we can't explain it any more than we can explain the beauty of the universe. There's no way of telling people they're walking around shining like the sun. There's no way of convincing people with words that they're walking around shining like the sun. And as we know in a line attributed to Francis of Assisi, where he says we must preach the gospel at all times and we must use words if necessary. And I think that's what Thomas Merton is capturing here in this sentence, that we cannot tell people in words that they're walking around shining like the sun. But we can certainly treat them like they're shining like the sun. We can treat them in the way that befits someone in the image of Christ. And so we turn now to the final step the final stage of the transformative cycle of Praxis. And this is where we begin to take on the mind and heart of Christ to respond to this tremendous gift of beauty and the infinite act of gracious love that is present to us in the incarnation. We are called and invited to give birth to beauty in our actions, our attitudes, and in our words. And I believe there is nothing more needed today than giving witness to the beauty of human dignity, to the beauty of human action. Franciscan transformation can take two forms. And one we see on the left is captured by Bonaventure in his itinerarium, that the goal of the transformative journey is a transformation into union with Christ, into the experience of the stigmata that Francis himself experienced on Mount Alberno. And this is how Bonaventure captures the final stage, the final moment of our union with God in love, 
in the beauty of identification with Christ. But Duns Scotus also captures another way of thinking about this transformation into beauty and into the person of Christ. And this can be seen in the um, fresco captured on the right. And this is the act of generosity where Francis, still a young man, just before his conversion, is captured by a moment of compassion and reaches out in self-gift to the poor man. So we see the generosity of Francis even as a young man before he's reached the stage of complete identification with Christ. And even early in his life, he's invited and responds to the invitation to pour himself out in service to the poor, to the poor man. And this is the call that I want to explore now in the time that remains, as we think about our response following the path of love, using the gifts we've been given and being gift to the world. In this fresco, Francis meets a noble, humbled knight. This is a knight who's returned from the Crusades, who's come back from the war. He is both wounded by his um, experience in the war, but he's also poor and in need of a cloak. And Bonaventure writes in his major legend, act of generosity. In this beautiful act, Francis completes two acts of piety. The first act is to give the poor man what the poor man needs. But the second act, even more important, is to treat the wounded person with the dignity he, reserve, he deserves. So for us, what this means is the Franciscan vision of beauty is not just about what we do, but it's about how we do it, how we treat others, how we reach out, how we respond to the brokenness around us, to the brokenness in the world. As Scotus describes the dynamic going on in the heart of Francis and in our human heart, he captures this dynamic of two energies. We have a twofold energy within us, and we've been naturally gifted with this twofold energy. The first energy is an energy directed toward ourselves, toward our good, toward our own happiness, for wholeness, for our perfection. It is not selfish. It is rather an important and healthy regard for my own good. But this is not the only energy we have, says Curtis. We also have within us a deep yearning, an energy for value, an energy for things of intrinsic worth, like truth, independent of myself. It's an energy for others that reaches out to others, for loving rightly, and the energy for the common good. So we might capture these two energies as we think about Francis as he faced this noble, humbled knight. And there was, for him, the energy to keep his own cloak. We can imagine it was a cold day. But in the presence of someone who was needier than he was, Francis was moved by the deeper energy, this energy for goodness, for generosity, for loving rightly, for the common good. And Scotus argues that these two energies that exist within us hold the key for self-mastery and rational freedom. So for Scotus, freedom is not doing everything I want. Rather, freedom involves the following. It involves choosing in light of God's generous love and beauty. It involves balancing these two energies, self and other, my good and common good, to make sure they're in appropriate harmonic balance. And when these two energies are in appropriate balance, then Scotus argues, our action reveals the perfection of beauty and rationality. This is true freedom. 
when I'm so able to balance myself internally, balance my energies in light of situations around me that may be difficult, that's when I'm exercising the highest form of freedom, the highest form of self-mastery, and ultimately I'm able to pour myself out, pour my gifts out in self-gift. And the goal, of course, is artistic-like balance, if we stay in this metaphor of beauty, that like the dancer, like the athlete, like the musician, the artist, the studio artist, this inner still point of readiness. For any of you who've had experience with studio arts, I'm pleased to have captured this picture of someone who's making a pot, because as you would know, there is nothing more difficult than the balance required of a student trying to create a pot on the wheel with the water and with the holding, holding the hands just tightly enough, not too tightly, or the clay will collapse, not too loosely, or the clay will be scattered all over the room. So this is the goal that we're looking for. This is true freedom, to become artists in our own world, giving birth to that type of artistic beauty. And what this also means, it calls our attention, as Franciscans do, to the present moment, that each moment of each day opens as a gift for communion, for generosity, for self-gift, for creating beauty and giving birth to beauty. And the Spirit comes to help us, as St. Paul says, because the Spirit whispers inspirations to generosity. Francis was moved by compassion. And I love to use this metaphor of the audible, which as many of you know, comes from football, that the quarterback calls the audible on the line of scrimmage and the players on the line of scrimmage must always listen, listen for the play count because the quarterback may very well call a play that was not called in the huddle but needs to be called now on the line of scrimmage. So to continue the metaphor, we might say, the spirit is the quarterback and we're the players on the line of scrimmage and we listen for the count. I think Scotus and the Franciscan tradition would say each day, the quarterback will call one play. Are we listening? Are we paying attention? Or is everything drowned out by the noise around us? The people in the, in the stands who are cheering, they cheer in order to distract the players. The people who are making noise around us, whether it's Twitter noise, whether it's the noise of everyday life, whatever it might be, all of these noises get in our way as we seek to listen daily for the Spirit's inspiration, the audible. And we're called, as Francis does, to give birth to beauty in our world. Our acts of kindness and gracious generosity, Francis says in his letter to the faithful, give birth to him by means of our actions, which should shine as an example to others. And the shining forth of beauty in our actions and in our daily life is what we're called to be and do in this vision of beauty, this pathway of transformation. So what difference does the Franciscan vision make? What difference does this via pulchritudinus, this way of beauty make? And what difference do we make when we've been transformed into this vision? It's a hope-filled vision of the human person and our human society, which is so needed today. It's an abundant vision of divine action and the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to whisper the audible, to be with us. It's an ongoing and continuing affirmation of divine presence in and through the incarnation. For God so loved the world as to become one of us. And it's an invitation that we continually go beyond ourselves in gratitude, and generosity toward those around us. And finally, it's an invitation each day for us to pour out our gifts and our lives and our love 
in generous living, to make the world a more beautiful place, to introduce the reign of God here in our midst. And so I, I know of no one better to quote than Benedict XVI in his beautiful encyclical Caritas in Veritate, who argues that today is in such need of this vision, this way of seeing our human life and human dignity. And Benedict writes, only if we're aware of this calling as individuals and as a community to be part of God's family as sons and daughters, the kinship, the ethic kinship that Francis speak, Pope Francis speaks about, only then will we be able to generate a new vision and muster new energy in the service of a truly integral humanism. For the greatest service to development is a Christian humanism, and I would say a Christian Franciscan humanism that enkindles charity and takes its lead from truth, accepting both as a lasting gift from God. And openness to God makes us open toward our brothers and sisters and toward an understanding of life as a joyful task to be accomplished in a spirit of solidarity. What a beautiful invitation, what a beautiful vision that we can help give birth to today. So are we ready to engage with this invitation? Are we ready to respond to the, to the experience of beauty, to join in the transformative path of beauty in our own day, in our own life, for the life of the world? And as I close, or we come to a close of this presentation, several questions you might want to think about in your own life going forward. What nourishes your awareness of beauty within you and around you? And how have your gifts become gifts that you share now in your life? How might this Franciscan vision of the via pulchritudinis a vision of transformative, inclusive, and active love transform your own reflection on this moment, this moment in our lives, in the life of our nation, in the life of our world. And finally, how do you already participate in this glorious and beautiful vision, this Franciscan vision of generous giftedness? And as we close this evening's reflection, let us take up the call that Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins presents, for he too was influenced by the Franciscan tradition, to look carefully at the beauty around us, to care for our dear, dear earth, and to care for one another, and to strive each day to embody that generosity that comes in response to our experience of beauty, to an experience of divine love for each one of us and for our beautiful, suffering, and so fragile world. Thank you.